In today's video, I'll be documenting one of the most difficult builds that I've completed to date. I'm calling this one the Double Ender, because I started with a normal Ender 3 V2 and basically doubled everything about it. It's got dual Z screws, dual extruders, dual main boards, also that I can achieve dual material printing. This took a lot longer than one of my normal modding videos, but I learned a lot in the process, and if you watch to the end, you'll learn a lot too. Once you've removed the power supply, in order to be safe, you need to make sure all the capacitors are discharged. This power supply has been turned off for over a month, so I know this one doesn't have any stored energy. You can see here, I've already installed a 12 volt knock to a fan into this port. Our next issue is that this fan is a little bit thicker than our previous fan. It looks like it's bumping into this part right here, and some of these components right here. I'm going to use this marker to color in any areas that need to be cut back in order to get this to fit. I just realized that you literally can't fit a fan this size into this case. That's not going to stop me from trying. I just need to take this piece off. If we can just glue it right here, that should be good. So I'm going to gently sand the area that I'm gluing to. Then do the same for the part of the Noctua fan. Prepare both surfaces with some alcohol. Then take a swig for good measure. I had to mill out this little channel here to make room for that jumper wire. My adhesive today is going to be some Permatex Ultra Black Gasket Maker. I'm using a silicone based adhesive rather than an epoxy just because silicone handles thermal expansion really well. And I'll need to wait about 24 hours for this adhesive to cure. While I was down here, I figured out a cool way to mount this fan. There's normally a big wire bundle right here, but I cut the zip tie holding that together and squished all the wires up into this corner. And then I took these zip ties, threaded them through this hole, and these fit just right so that when I pull them through, they pretty much stay. When I need to access everything down here, I just move it to the side, and then I can access the wiring. I'm tired of 3D printer manufacturers that randomly assign pins to positive and negative. So I've started using these rectifiers. On this end, I can plug it into a DC power source. I can have the positive and negative terminals swapped and it's not an issue because it gets rectified. And then that gets regulated down to 12 volts. And then I can plug in these cables over here. And any knock to a fan, I can just easily plug in and run. Now this regulator will be generating a bit of heat. I just tuck it in here so that it can be cooled off by the fan that it's powering. And we're good to go. The only extra thing I've done is I added a DC barrel plug output. So that's just plugged into the power supply in these two pins right here. And that just gives me 24 volts DC to work with to power any extra accessories that I'm going to plug in out here. Once you've removed the hot end cover, you can take this fan out. It's just held in by two screws, so undo those. And then install your new silent fan. I'm also going to do a quick hot end upgrade here. This is the Fetus Tai Chi hot end. You can see in the top it's got two inlets for different types of filament. So this will allow you to do multi-material printing. That was pretty easy to install, so now I'll just take the heater cartridges out and put them in this new hot end. This thing will probably work just fine if I just want to use one filament. But to get the most out of it, you're going to want to set up that second filament stream. It should be a pretty significant improvement over the stock hot end, because this heater block is made out of copper, and it's got an extremely thin heat break. I'm also going to install this dual Z-axis kit. I've got an issue with this thing right off the bat. Instead of the stepper motor sitting flat against the frame, it's actually lifted up a little bit. This is a classic issue where the mechanical engineer and the manufacturing engineer weren't communicating. What likely happened here is this piece is injection molded, so they added a draft angle to make it easier to manufacture. It's basically a slight angle that they put on a molded part to make it easier to remove from the mold. You can see the walls aren't perfectly straight, so they've added a draft angle to make it easier to demold your muffins. Now you can add a draft angle and maintain a 90 degree angle. How you'd do that is you'd leave one side square and double the draft angle on the other side. That way it'd still be easy to remove from the mold, but they didn't do that here, so I'm just gonna have to sand this down a little bit. So I'm just gonna sand this until I get my 90 degree angle. So that did the trick. So I just put this longer bolt in here, thread on one aluminum spacer, the V-groove wheel, a second aluminum spacer, and then I'll attach the nylock bolt on the other side. I'm gonna install this bearing on the existing lead screw. And then tighten those down. I'm just going to lift this up about a millimeter. You can see this putty knife fits under there. And that'll keep this coupler from grinding on the stepper motor. And I'll tighten this nut down so that it's locked in place. So I've got my nut certs in place. I'm ready to heat them up and sink them into this plastic part. Having it attached to this bolt makes it really easy for me to move it around. So I'm going to heat this up. 
I usually do it to the count of 10, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Make sure that the bolt is somewhat perpendicular and it's all flush with the part. This bolt that I'm holding is actually getting pretty hot. Ow, ooh, yeah, that's hot. All right, those look like they're in the right spot, so I'm gonna take this over to the sink and get them cooled off. Sometimes the plastic kind of sticks to the bolt here, so I'll just go ahead and trim that off. We don't have to use these little aluminum spacers anymore because they're being replaced by the brass ones that are embedded into this plastic. And now I'm going to install this direct drive extruder. So I just drop this in like this, and then attach the motor. If you look at the amount of friction that a Bowden tube experiences, it's related to the length of the tube and how many degrees of turn that it has. So if you have a Bowden tube that loops around several times, it's going to have a lot more friction than one that's perfectly straight. And I want to type make menu config. And you might wonder, how do I know how to type these commands in? Well, I'll tell you, basically, I'm really smart and I'm able to figure it out by myself. Uh, so I think I need to set the options that the config tells me to at the top. All right, so I'm running my first print on Clipper. Already it looks much faster and much more aggressive. Just look at it. Look at it go. This print was done in 55 minutes on a 0.6 millimeter steel nozzle. I repackaged all the wiring so it's much cleaner down here. And I threw another Ender 3 main board that I have. It's just being used to power that one extra stepper motor. Here's the Raspberry Pi and here's some miscellaneous electronics. The way this works is both of these boards are plugged into the Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi is telling them both what to do and they're working in unison. Clipper is pretty darn cool. It's difficult to set up, but the advantage is pretty much anything you can think of in terms of just plugging 3D printer components together, you can get it to work. I'm ready to start my first multi-material print. So I've got direct drive and Bowden tube on one machine with two different materials. So we'll see how this ladybug print turns out. And just like that, I've finished my first multi-material print and I was able to get it to work on my first try. I also had a pretty interesting opportunity to compare direct drive and Bowden tube on the same machine. You can see on this direct drive version, the print turned out much nicer. Compare that to the Bowden tube setup. It's not laying down the filament exactly where it's supposed to be. And then you compare that against the direct drive extruder. See, this thing looks nearly perfect by comparison. And these were printed with the exact same G-code on the exact same hot end with the exact same printer. So this is about as much of an apples to apples comparison as you can get. I should note that though I was having a lot of trouble getting this to work reliably, the direct drive extruder side of it always changed filaments successfully. Now I've got two direct drive extruders on this machine. So now I have a fully functioning dual material printer. It took a while to work out all the bugs, but printing with two different colors of PLA is just the beginning for this machine. One of the most interesting material combinations, in my opinion, is going to be mixing carbon fiber nylon with regular nylon. Plain nylon is incredibly flexible and tough. It's like TPU on steroids. These two materials have opposite material properties, but they should have excellent bonding between the two materials because they're made out of the same base nylon. So hopefully you learned something in this episode and maybe you want to try some of these mods out yourself. I'll be leaving links to all the products in the description below. I'll also be releasing a couple versions of this direct drive extruder upgrade, including a couple versions that'll work on a stock Ender 3. So head over to my Patreon if you want to get early access to those CAD models. I'd like to give a special thanks to Fatus for sending over their new Tai Chi hot end as a pre-production model. I'd also like to thank my patrons. With their help, I was able to afford this piece of artificial chest hair that's improving my audio quality. And Rolahan for helping me through the Clipper install.